If you're a church sound tech and you see technical specs like 32-bit float or 96 kilohertz, does it make you kind of scratch your head and wonder what it means? Or do you resign yourself to the idea that more must be better, so more numbers is more gooder? Well, in this video, I'm gonna take away some of the mystery around sample rate and bit rate and help you understand what they're doing so that when you see tech specs, you're not ooh and ah, but you know what it actually means and how it's gonna affect your workflow and how everything comes together for your church sound system. Hey, if we haven't met yet, my name is James and I help church sound techs, worship leaders, and tech directors eliminate the mystery and frustration around sound at church. So if that's you, you found the right place. But before we jump in, YouTube Analytics is telling me that 73% of you that watch regularly don't subscribe. So if you would do me a favor, and even half of those people would hit subscribe, I would get a whole lot more subscribers and it would help my channel out a lot. So if you're thankful for the comment, it doesn't cost you a lot, just mash your thumb on that button, hit subscribe, and thank you in advance. Before we can talk about sample rate and bit rate, we really have to talk about what's going on with audio itself and why that matters. Before we can get to digital audio, we have to get through analog audio. But even before we get to analog audio, we have to talk about actual sound waves themselves. Don't worry, I'm gonna tell you the quick version because I could definitely nerd out about this for a long time. And actually I do nerd out about this for a long time in my amateur to pro course inside the Attaway Audio Academy. So if you're wanting to go deeper and you like this kind of stuff, you can sign up through the link down in the description below. Now sound waves are wiggling air molecules. So something vibrates and it creates high pressure and low pressure in waves that come out from whatever's vibrating. On the other end, this resonates inside of our ear and we perceive it as a sound. So there's the acoustics part of sound and there's the psychoacoustics part of sound. Sounds that have a higher frequency vibrate quicker and sounds with a lower frequency vibrate slower. The range that our ears can pick up sounds is from 20 hertz or 20 cycles per second all the way up to 20,000 hertz or 20K. This covers about 10 octaves. And as we age, as you can see that I'm aging a little bit, some of those very highest frequencies tend to shave off. And if you've exposed yourself to loud sounds, some other frequencies can diminish in your perception as well. So always have ear protection available. You don't wanna lose your hearing. Now, if we wanna manipulate and amplify and capture those audio signals, we can do so with a microphone. A microphone takes those wiggling air molecules and turns them into wiggling electrons. So now we have some alternating current electricity on our mic cable that then we can transmit to a soundboard, plug into an amplifier, juice up the signal and put it into a speaker and now we've made stuff more loud. If we're gonna take a look at that a little bit slower, the voltage at our microphone is very low. It's called microphone level, who would have thunk? But for our consoles and other gear to use it, we wanna get it up to line level. Line level professional is zero dB VU, or if you've ever seen those old analog meters on a nice old analog sound console, the zero part there is our zero VU. And that's our target spot for how loud we want our signal or how much level we want from our signal to get into the console and then to send to our amplifiers later. If our signal is too much above line level, it can distort. And if our signal is too much below line level, then as we're adding in level later, it can be noisy. So distortion is bad, noise is bad. We want our signal to be a happy medium right there in the middle. The difference between those two is called the dynamic range of our signal or the dynamic range of the components that can handle that. So between distortion and the noise floor, that's our dynamic range. Now that we have electrons wiggling back and forth, they're wiggling back and forth at the exact same way that the air molecules were wiggling back and forth. This means it's an analog or analogous electrical signal. But when we try to plug that into a computer that only knows ones and zeros, we're kind of stuck, right? Ones and zeros are just on and off. So how do we get a very continuously variable electrical signal into ones and zeros? Now we enter into the analog to digital converter. The analog to digital converter converts the signal and this voltage by taking a lot of really, really fast measurements of the levels. At each measurement, it puts it on a stair step to say how much level is here at any given time. The number of sample pictures that it takes 
takes in a given second is called the sample rate. The number of stair steps that we have is called the bit rate or bit depth. The sample rate determines the highest frequency that we can capture with that audio signal. The bit depth determines our dynamic range or the range between we can't measure anymore and this signal is so low that I can't really measure that it even starts to do something. We'll come back to bit rate in just a minute, but let's talk about sample rate first. The original gangster sample rate that we had for our audio CDs was 44,100 samples per second or 44.1. Soon thereafter, DVD audio actually used 48 kilohertz, which made it easier to sync up with frame rates on video. So there was a good reason for that. This was mainly done for audio and video sync reasons. Sample rate determines two different things about our audio. It determines the highest frequency that we can capture, and it determines the processing speed at which we can manipulate the audio and then spit it back out. Because sound waves have oscillating pressure, so there's high pressure and then low pressure to create one wave, we have to have the sample rate be at least twice that in order to capture that frequency. So if we wanna capture up to 20 kilohertz, we need our sample rate to be above 40 kilohertz. Digital audio processors look at each of the samples as they're coming into it to determine what am I gonna do with it and make a change. So while we used electronic components for EQ and compression before, now we're telling a little tiny computer program to tell the audio what to do, and it's gotta look at some of the audio before it can respond to how it manipulates the audio. This little gap in time is called latency. And if you've ever dealt with latency, say you hear an echo on a Zoom call and you hear yourself coming back at yourself, that can really throw you off. So for music and for monitoring music, latency is a big deal that you want to try to avoid at all costs. Our digital audio consoles have really smart engineers that have figured out exactly what audio processing they can do with the power that they have from the computers that they have to make it really streamlined and reliable. So your live console probably has an acceptable range of latency and the limitation of how much stuff it can do inside of that console is also determined by how much latency we can tolerate. Now, one other thing about sample rate and digital audio is that it has to be linked together when you have multiple units that are receiving and sending the same types of digital audio signals. This is called clocking, and in a system, there's usually one master, and the rest of the units are slaved to that one unit. So if you're hearing clicks and pops in your system and something's not sounding right, make sure that all your systems are set to the same clock clock source, and of course, that they're set to the same sample rate. Bit depth, on the other hand, determines our dynamic range, or what's the loudest signal we can capture and then manipulate afterwards, and the quietest signal that we can capture and do something with. The example I'm about to share with you is kinda complicated, but so is digital audio, so you're just gonna have to bear with me. Imagine that we have the task of measuring all the different animals at the zoo. So we've got giraffes and we've got frogs, but we've only got a meter stick. So how are we gonna make all this work together? If the measuring stick is shorter than the giraffe, the only information that we're gonna have is that the giraffes are bigger than the measuring stick. That's like we've turned up our levels and they've exceeded zero dB FS, or decibels full scale. That's the level measurement that we use for digital audio and it tells us how much headroom we have before we can't measure anything else up above there. Yeah, if I gain it up too much and I hit the red, it sounds bad. I've run out of bits, so I can't measure anymore and it sounds kind of crunchy like this. So don't do that. If our measuring stick only had one inch increments, then the frogs that are smaller than an inch wouldn't even show up on the scale. The only thing we might know is that, yes, maybe there is a frog there, but we don't know if it's nine tenths of an inch or three tenths of an inch tall. We just don't have that information. This is what happens when your signal level is too low going into your analog to digital converter or AD converter. I might say that the rest of the video because it's a little easier to roll off the tongue. In audio terms, this usually means that the reverb tail or some of the resonances, especially in the higher frequencies, tend to get lost with lower bit rates. And I'll talk about the different types of bit rates in just a second. So if our input needs enough headroom to accurately measure giraffes and measure the difference between the different heights of the giraffes, but we also have to measure our frogs, what are we gonna do? Well, we have to set our input so that our headroom 
is up high enough to measure those highest signals. And so we relate zero dB VU, like we had with our analog meters, to about negative 18 dB FS. That means that when those signals are at the same level, there's 18 dB of headroom before the signal clips when we're at line level professional with our analog gear. But in order to measure the smaller stuff, we use a preamp before the AD converter to bring that level up so that we can get significant measurements of those audio signals. The preamp boosting the signal is kind of like building a platform that's up at the shoulder height of the giraffes so the little animals can still fit on the scale. The other thing that might help measure these frogs is to have millimeter increments rather than centimeter increments. Having a higher bit depth means that we have more little tick marks on our measuring stick, and so the dynamic range of the loudest sound that we can capture and the quietest sound that we can capture is greatly increased. To use another analogy that has nothing to do with the zoo is imagine that we've taken a picture with a digital camera, but it's got an actual zoom lens on it, right? So we can go from maybe 50 millimeters to 200 millimeters with a zoom lens. At 200 millimeters, if we cut off the head of our subject, there's no amount of Photoshop that can get that back except for AI, but AI doesn't really help us in live audio at the moment. So if we've cut off the head of our subject with our lens being zoomed in too far, we're out of luck. On the flip side, if we zoom all the way out and we're far away from our subject, but we want to get close up to that subject later, we've got to zoom in digitally and now we see all the pixels from that. You've probably done this trying to take a picture with your cell phone of something that's far away and then you zoom in with your thumbs and all you've got is a bunch of different pixels. That's what it's like when our gain is too low. For digital audio, 16-bit is the OG bit rate that we had on audio CDs, but we quickly went to 24-bit with our DVDs. 24-bit is also where we've been living with our digital audio consoles for the last several years. So most of your gear is gonna be 24-bit. You don't have to worry about 16-bit anymore. 16-bit had about 65,000 levels of resolution or little stair steps, whereas 24-bit has over 16 million stair steps. If 16-bit had 96 decibels of dynamic range, 24-bit has 144 decibels of dynamic range. It's a lot more. This also means that as long as you're hitting negative 48 on your digital audio meter on a 24-bit console, you're using all the same number of bits as you did with a 16-bit recording. So bit depth and our dynamic range is not the absolute weakest link and we don't have to blame the digital audio for our stuff sounding bad anymore. Now as we move up to 32-bit float, this one's a little bit tricky to get your head around and my example might not be the best, but bear with me. For 32-bit float, imagine we've got four of our meter sticks stacked together so that we can measure the tiniest frogs down at the very bottom and we can measure all of the giraffes up at the very top. And I don't know if giraffes are taller or shorter than four meters, but just leave me alone on that one, okay? 32-bit float chooses from all of those four meter sticks on the input side and then creates a meaningful signal on what it transmits after the fact. A lot of the internal processing on our consoles and digital audio workstations is already happening at 32-bit. The biggest difference for 32-bit is really on the recording and post-production side because you could leave your preamp level low and then boost up later without losing any details or low-level signals. So what does higher sample rates and bit depths do for you? Well, there's two things that the higher sample rate will do. The first thing is that it increases the processing speed. Because every processor takes a certain number of samples to do its job, if you have twice as many samples coming in in the same amount of time, that means that that processor can operate more quickly. This comes at the expense of computing power, which makes the console more expensive, but Hey, faster is faster. The other thing that higher sample rates do is help with aliasing. And this has to do with what artifacts come in digital audio when we have a clipped signal. So when we have clipping or distortion inside digital audio, it can actually create overtones that go up out of the audible spectrum and then bend back around into the audible spectrum to create things that sound weird. I know I probably just lost a bunch of you and I'm even kind of lost on how all of that works. So if you want, I'll drop a link to another video that explains it and demonstrates it a little bit better on why higher sample rates might be important. But if you're just running a very clean console and you're not doing any distortion or saturation or getting any warmth from your compressors or plugins, it's not a big deal. If you are trying to do that kind of stuff, it does become a big deal. So that's why higher sample rates can be better for your digital audio console. 
On analog to digital converters, having 32-bit float might be really cool, but at the same time, we're doing live audio in real time. We don't have the post-production luxury of boosting the gain after the fact, so you're gonna have to get your gain in the right place for everywhere else that signal has to go. Whether that's to the monitor mixes, whether that's to the broadcast or front of house, we need enough gain right now, so 32-bit float might not be the biggest factor in making an improvement in your audio workflow, but it is showing up on higher end consoles that might have better preamps and better filtering and better all the rest of the stuff too. So it's a cumulative effort in that I wouldn't say that 32-bit is a game changer and it's gonna solve all your problems. You still have to get your mix going no matter what the bit depth is. Now, I could be proven wrong on all of this and I welcome your comments down below. Let me know what you think about 32-bit float and if it really makes makes a big difference in live audio. And if you're a super nerd, please, please comment all you want. Just be nice to me. So hopefully this video has been helpful for you in understanding what audio myths to disregard and which things are most important when you're setting up your mix and deciding what gear to purchase. If you want help practicing mixing, which makes a much bigger difference in your end result, I'd highly encourage you to set up virtual sound checks so that you can practice when the band is not there. To help you do this, I made the free virtual sound check challenge that walks you through how to set up your console and different recorders so that you can get it set up and start practicing. Practice Practicing and developing the gear between the ears is still going to make the biggest difference, hands down. So if you want to sign up, I'll put a link down in the description below. Don't forget to hit subscribe and mash that thumbs up. It really helps the YouTube algorithm know that this content is good stuff. And if you like it, others need to see it too. Remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. I'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.